as politically incorrect, out-of-date subjects would go, I think the subject of repentance would have to be right up there on the list. Repentance, I mean, what's that? Who even talks that way anymore? I mean, come on, repentance, really? Hi, I'm Bertie Diamond. Welcome to Christianity Works as we continue with the next message in our series called Overboard with Jesus. Look, there are so many people who believe in Jesus, who, who attend church, who, who profess a faith in Christ, and yet they're living out a lukewarm form of Christianity, a sort of Christianity where how they live, what they do, what they say, how they spend their money, how they spend their time and their talents doesn't match up with the faith that they profess, with the songs that they sing on Sunday morning, Jesus is Lord. Well, hey, that's really easy to sing. It's a whole bunch harder to live. And because being a Christian means swimming against the tide, swimming against the flow, a lot of people kind of, I don't know, they just give up. They don't actually stop believing in Jesus. They just stop living for Jesus. And so what they end up living out is a lukewarm Form of Christianity. A couple of weeks ago when we kicked off this series, we went first to Revelations uh, chapter 3, and I want to go back there again just to pick up on what Jesus said about living out a lukewarm faith. Beginning at verse 15, I know your works, says Jesus. You are neither cold nor hot. I, I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. That's a pretty graphic picture isn't it i'm about to spit you out of my mouth for you say i am rich i have prospered i need nothing you don't realize that you're wretched pitiable poor blind and naked i wonder how many people relate to that you've been living in a comfortable sort of zone and and you've just been going through day to day doing what you do and along comes jesus and, and confronts you this way saying, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because you're neither cold nor hot. I mean, if you're cold, at least I know you're against me. If you're hot, I know you're on fire for me. But this, this, this lukewarm business, that's just not on. It's like a, a lukewarm cup of tea. I'm going to take a sip. I'm going to spit you out because there's nothing more revolting than a lukewarm cup of tea. Uh, Jesus is very direct. Jesus is not mucking around. And then last week on the program we decided to go and visit Peter and the other disciples out on the Sea of Tiberias, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33, where they've just finished that whole big miracle where Jesus has fed the 5,000 with uh, two fishes and five loaves. And Jesus goes to dismiss the crowd and, and then he heads up the mountain to pray. And he sends the disciples on ahead of him in a boat across the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee, as we may know it, um, to the other side where he was going to minister to the Gentiles. Now, look, a number of these disciples were fishermen. It was no big deal. They got in the boat, they headed off, and then the big storm hit. And we saw that amazing story where Jesus comes walking out. Uh, they think he's a ghost, but Peter gets out of the water in the middle of the storm to be with Jesus. And I think that's the sort of heart that God wants us to have, this, this full-on overboard with Jesus kind of attitude where we're going to live our lives for him. The other 11 disciples stayed in the boat. They're not the ones that are mentioned in this story. It's Peter who, the moment he realizes Jesus is walking out on the water in the middle of the storm, says, Lord, I want to be with you. If it's really you, call me out onto the water to you. And Jesus calls him and out Peter goes. And Peter goes in the middle of the storm. You see, he doesn't wait for the storm to finish. You and I, we, we want things to be everything okay. We want all our circumstances to be right before we get out of the boat. But I believe Jesus is calling a lot of people out of the boat, a lot of his people out of the boat today in the middle of their storms to get out there and do what he's called them to do, live out the calling on their lives. Uh, the Bible says that the giftings and the calling of God are completely irrevocable. It means no one can take them away. You have a call on your life if you believe in Jesus. Jesus is calling you to use the gifts and the abilities and the talents and the time and the resources that he's given you for his glory to go and do what he's called you to do. And sometimes he calls us out of the boat in the middle of the storm. 
Now, today we're going to continue on with some practical things that you can do to follow Jesus, some practical things that you can do to live your life overboard with Jesus, full on for Jesus. And the first one I want to talk about, as I hinted at the beginning of the program, is to repent from the sin of being a lukewarm Christian, to repent from the sins that you're holding back from God. You see, we're pretty good at saying, Jesus, I want to serve you. I want to follow you. I want to worship you. You're the Lord of my life. But you know this, this one little thing? I don't want to give that up. It might be financial. It might be sexual immorality. It might be a sin of gossiping. It might be, I, I don't want you in this part of my life. If you want to live your life overboard with Jesus, like full on for Christ, then you can't do it unless you repent of your sin. The question is, what is repentance? And, and why is it so important? I want to share a parable with you that Jesus told. Matthew chapter 13, if you have a Bible, open it. We're going to look at a parable from verses 1 to 8. Again, for many people, this is a familiar parable. But we sometimes read these things, and, and we don't read them as though Jesus is speaking to us. Well, I think he is speaking to us. I think that this parable is something that Jesus wants to speak into your life and my life today. Come with me. Let's have a look. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds ate them up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground where they didn't have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell amongst the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Okay, well, what's that got to do with you and me today? What's that got to do with the subject of, of having a lukewarm faith? What's that got to do with the subject of repentance. Well, Jesus goes on to explain this parable to his disciples. So in case it doesn't quite make sense, let's have a listen to Jesus' explanation of this parable. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom of God and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no roots but endures only for a while, and then trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown in good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, and who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case hundredfold, in another sixty, and another thirty. You see, some people respond to the word of God and they fall away because there are no roots. They haven't grown roots down and put a roots down in, in a relationship with Jesus. They're not being constantly fed by the word of God. Well, if, you, if you know anyone like that. And then there are those who fall on good soil, but the cares of this world and the lure of wealth grow like thorns and thistles and end up killing the wheat. You know that thorns and thistles seem to grow better than crops and they destroy the wheat. I think there are a lot of people in that category. A lot of people living out this kind of, this, this lukewarm Christianity, this, this faith where the things of this world are far more important, where the desire to have a great career and lots of money and travel and, and this, that and the other, are far more important than the word of God. And those people end up falling away. And then there are ones who fall on good soil and put down roots and, and they grow a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold fruit. They're the ones that Jesus wants us to be. So my, my question to you is, which category do you fall into? Did you once hear the word of God, but you were like the seed that fell on the, on the road, on the path? And, and the moment there was temptation, the devil came along and plucked you away. Are you the one who fell into the rocky ground and you put down root, but only went certain, so deep? And then when the sun came out, you burned and you withered? Are you the one among the thorns or are you the one that is bearing all the fruit? Which, which one are you? Is your life bearing fruit for Jesus? 
Because Jesus said it is to the Father's glory that you should bear fruit. The natural consequence, the natural outcome of a vibrant faith in Jesus is to bear fruit. I'm sharing this with you today because I feel God wants you to hear a message of repentance. God doesn't want to condemn you. I believe God's calling you back. If you've strayed away, if, if you've been choked up by the thorns, if, if you've withered because you haven't put your roots down, I, I believe God's speaking to you today and he is calling you to repent. Well, what does repentance mean? It just simply means to turn around. That's all it means. It's a, a fancy word, a theological word. Some think of it as an old-fashioned word. All it means is to turn around, to turn away from what you know is wrong and to turn back from God. Come with me, please, to Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says, repent therefore and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. There are people listening today. You, you kind of believe in Jesus, but it's not going the way it's meant to be going. It's, it's hard. You need times of refreshing. Repent therefore and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the presence of God. Would you like me to pray a prayer of repentance right now that you can pray with me? Are you wanting these times of refreshing? Has God been speaking to you through this parable? What, come on, why don't we pray a prayer, prayer of repentance together? Father, we have heard your word today. We, we acknowledge that we have drifted away from you into a, a lukewarm faith, a faith that's choked up by the things of this world and the desires of this world. And we hear Jesus calling us to repentance. We hear you calling us to turn away from our sin and to turn to you because, Lord, we desperately, desperately need these times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. Forgive us for our sin. Lord, we're really sorry. We turn away from it now. We turn back to you to live our lives full on for you so that our lives will bear fruit a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, whatever you call us to, that we may bring glory to you. Father, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you that you will send your Holy Spirit upon us to bless us and to fill us and to refresh us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you know something? There's a reason they call this the good news. It's fantastic news. God loves you so much. God is calling you back to him today to turn away from your sin, to turn away from what you know is wrong so that you can live your life full on for Jesus, so that you, like Peter, can get overboard with Jesus. And that's the name of the free booklet that we've published this month at Christianity Works, Overboard with Jesus, building on the teaching in this series with some life application questions at the end of each chapter so that you can, you can think through what the Word of God really means in your life and apply it to your life. I would love to send you a free copy of that booklet right now, Overboard with Jesus. Get in touch. Our website is always the easiest place to go or give us a call on the toll-free number and we will get that booklet straight out to you, Overboard with Jesus. May you be blessed as you receive God's word. I'm Bernie Diamond, and you're watching Christianity Works. God's word says that if we say that we have no sin, we're absolutely kidding ourselves. We're absolutely deluding ourselves. Come with me to 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Again, God is calling you to turn your life back to him. God is calling you to admit your sin. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, is death. This is a really serious thing. This is not something small. There is no such thing as small sin. God's calling you and me to repent of our sin today because he wants to have a rich, dynamic relationship with each one of us. And he went to such huge lengths for us to be able to have our sin forgiven. Jesus died for you and me. He suffered. He, 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 he was in agony hanging there on the cross. The Son of God, the one who created the whole universe, died for you and me so that we could simply go to God, confess our sins and be forgiven because Jesus paid the price for our sins on the cross. There's no good reason to delude ourselves. There's no good reason to run away from this. Come on, today is the day to turn your life back to Jesus. And the thing that flows out of that very naturally is for us then 
to forgive others. I mean, just think of the price that paid that was paid for you and me to be forgiven. The Son of God dying on a cross. So just look at this from God's perspective. God sends Jesus to die for us. He pays a huge price so that we could be forgiven. But then you and I carry unforgiveness around in our hearts for people who have wronged us. Well, what if who's wronged you just lately? Who's, who's the person who has wronged you, who has hurt you the most in your life? Can I ask you, have you forgiven them? There's someone, a man who betrayed me terribly and a woman who betrayed me terribly. It's over 20 years ago. And can I tell you, the burden of unforgiveness was so big because it was such a big betrayal. It, it hurt so much. And I knew when I became a Christian that God was calling me to forgive them. I'm not preaching here from a, a theory book or a textbook. I'm preaching here from a transformed life. Let me tell you, it was only by the power of the Holy Spirit that I was able to actually forgive them. And can I tell you, I still pray for them on a regular, regular basis because that is what Jesus calls us to do. So let's have a look at a parable about forgiveness and unforgiveness because like in any area, Jesus doesn't mince his words. Jesus is really direct on the subject of forgiveness because forgiveness is a huge deal for God. You just have to look at the cross of Christ to realize that. So come with me, please. We're going to Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 21. Peter came to Jesus and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, no, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. You see, if someone does something wrong against you, seven times, I tell you what, that's a lot of times to forgive, right? But Jesus says, no, not seven times, 77 times. He's using exaggeration. He's using hyperbole. He's saying, just keep on forgiving them and then he tells this parable come on let's have a look verse 23 of Matthew chapter 18 for this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves when he began the reckoning one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him and as he could not pay his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made so the slave fell on his knees before him saying have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Now out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then this fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will do also to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, to understand the meaning of this parable, we have to understand the amounts that are quoted. The first slave owed the king, let's have a look at it, 10,000 talents. Now, a talent was 15 years' wages for a laborer. So he owed him 150,000 years' worth of wages. That's incredible. That's a huge amount of money. And yet, when he pleaded with the king, the king forgave him this massive, massive amount. But this slave had a fellow slave who owed him 100 denarii. One denarii was one day's wages for a laborer. So 100 denarii was 100 days wages. You see the massive difference, the, the huge orders of magnitude difference between what the first slave owed the king and what the second slave owed the first slave. In other words, God has forgiven you so much. God has forgiven you all of your sin. Everything you've ever done wrong, God's wiped the slate clean because Jesus paid the price, a huge, terrible price on that cross. And God's saying, how can you not forgive the small things that other people do to you? And even if they feel big, they're still small compared to the price that Jesus paid for you on that cross. Do you get it? And look at the fate of that first slave when the king found out in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So 
my heavenly Father will do to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is a big deal. Jesus said at the end of the Lord's Prayer, if you don't forgive, neither will your Father forgive you. Now please, this is not me saying this. You understand, I'm just the messenger. This is Jesus saying this. And I honestly believe that between this parable and what Jesus said at the end of the Lord's Prayer, if we choose not to forgive, and therefore our Father chooses not to forgive us, then our salvation is in serious peril. Because if you get to heaven and stand before God, and he says, I am not forgiving you, because you didn't forgive that person or that person or that person from your heart. I've got to tell you, you and I are in serious, serious trouble. Like I said, forgiveness is a big deal for God. In fact, let's just go to the Lord's Prayer because again, it's a very, very familiar passage to us. And let's just read exactly what Jesus said. He taught his disciples to pray this way. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. Pray then this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and listen to this and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not bring us into a time of trial but rescue us from the evil one for if you forgive others their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others neither will your father forgive you your trespasses that's pretty clear, isn't it? There's no mincing of words. There's no, you, you cannot be in any doubt as to what Jesus is saying or what Jesus means. You and I are called to forgive those who have hurt us. Is it hard? Yes. Does it cost? Yes. We have to give up our right for recompense. We have to give up our right for retribution. We have to give up our, our right for vengeance. See, when someone hurts us, we feel like we're entitled to some sort of recompense, an apology. Um, maybe financial recompense, maybe some other sort of recompense. But God didn't get anything out of us when he forgave us because Jesus paid that price. You see, God's forgiveness of you and me had a terrible price. And so when you and I are called to forgive others, there is a price to pay too. It hurts to forgive people who don't deserve to be forgiven, who don't even ask for forgiveness. Oh, I can't forgive him. He hasn't asked me for forgiveness yet. No. There's nothing in there about waiting. Jesus is just forgive them. Well, how do you do that? I mentioned those people who deeply betrayed me over a couple of decades ago. How did I actually get to the point where in my heart I no longer had anger and vengeance? I did what Jesus told me to do. Come with me, please. We're going to Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 43. Jesus has an answer for everything. And if you are struggling to forgive someone from your heart, here is the answer for you. This is what Jesus says. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends his reign on the righteous and on the unrighteous. I read that and I thought, you know what? I'm going to start praying for my enemies. I'm going to start praying for these people. Father, bless them. Father, bring them to you. Father, let them meet Jesus. And you know what happened? God started to change my heart. It didn't happen overnight. But God changed my heart towards them. I no longer want vengeance or recompense from these people who betrayed me. My prayer for them is that they would meet the risen Christ my prayer for them is that they would be in heaven one day because I prayed for them, because God heard my prayer, because God answered my prayer. Friend, if you want to live a life that is full on for Christ, overboard with Jesus, then it's time to repent and it's time to forgive those who have hurt you. Are these things easy? No, they're not easy. They're hard. I've heard someone say, oh, well, God never asked you to do something that's beyond you. You know what my experience is? God is constantly asking me to do things that are beyond me, things that I cannot do in my own strength. That's why I need the power of the Holy Spirit in me. That's why I need God to work in me and through me. Father, I know there are people struggling to forgive. I know today there are people saying, God, I can't imagine forgiving that person. But we've just heard your word preached in power, preached through the Holy Spirit. 
And so we pray that you would convict us through your word to pray for our enemies, to listen to what Jesus said. And we pray that your spirit would work in our hearts to bring transformation, to bring forgiveness in Jesus' name. Amen. The word of God is, is mighty and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. As you receive the word of God today, I'm believing that God is going to make a huge difference, a huge difference in your life. Well, that's all we have time for today. I'm Bernie Diamond, and you've been watching Christianity Works. Again, don't forget that live application book that I've been telling you about. Get in touch with us today to request your copy. I'd love to get that teaching right into your hands. And if you're able to hop on our website, don't forget that you can have instant access to the free Christianity Works daily e-devotional. Words of inspiration, hope and encouragement delivered right to your inbox on your smartphone, tablet or computer each weekday. That's all at our website. And I'll catch you again same time next week with another message of God's love, God's grace and God's power for each one of us in Jesus Christ.